Hey, Mr. P here. In this video, we're going to talk about the chemical testing aspect of hair. Uh, in previous videos, we've talked about the anatomical and physical structures of hair. We've talked about uh, all the diff discrepancies and all the variations that's, that, that can be observed in different populations of people. But in this particular video, we're going to talk specifically about chemical testing and the protocols and the types of data that those particular tests can give you. So it should be pretty short. Uh, but to get started, you obviously can't do a chemical test on a piece of hair or on a hair sample until you have a collection um, of hair or a sample that is taken from an individual. And so hair is a, a piece of trace evidence. It cannot prove a suspect's guilt because there's no way of knowing when it was left. Obviously because in previous videos we've talked that there is a particular phase of hair development in which a lot of hairs um, can be shed. Right? Shedding is a normal part of mammalian chemistry, of mammalian biochemistry. And so um, hairs can and do often get shed all the time. And so because of that, you can't prove a person's guilt or you can't prove a person's innocence without getting other evidence. Okay, Hair is a piece of trace evidence uh, because there's no way of proving when it was actually left or deposited. So hair can be collected by plucking shaking, scraping, lifting with tape, or vacuumed in large areas. Um, it's conceivable to believe that if you went in with a vacuum into a particular room and you vacuumed the carpets or you vacuumed the floor that you would pick up hairs that were shed at various times um, since the last time you vacuumed. Um, same thing in a vehicle. Okay, Hairs can be found in a vehicle by vacuum. By vacuuming you can also lift hairs by lifting um, a certain upholstery with tape. Okay, um, and then again, plucking, shaking, or scraping uh, can lift hairs or can get hairs uh, as a sample as well. Forensic scientists must search all aspects of a crime scene for hair, including, like I said, vehicles under fingernails. It's really important to note that typically um, hairs can be found under the fingernails of a victim or a suspect if there is a physical altercation or a physical struggle because of the fact that hairs can so easily be scraped off and a fingernail is often um, a pretty good tool to use uh, when scraping. So on or in the victim's body, in blood from a victim or suspect, on weapons, tape, ligatures, abandoned clothes or masks, and explosive device mechanisms as well. Anything that has been touched can have or contain hairs because of the fact that hairs can be sloughed off so easily. Um, anywhere that a suspect or a victim has gone could potentially be a source of hair. Um, and so forensic scientists have to search everywhere in order to find those pieces of trace evidence that are the hairs. Chemical testing for substances in the hair shaft is one of the main chemical tests that can be performed on a particular individual. Um, anything that is ingested or absorbed through the skin ends up in your hair shaft and the hair shaft can actually be a pretty good timeline or can be used as a timeline um, in order to determine based on a, a normal growth rate when that individual was subjected to a particular toxin or chemical or poison um, and it's that data is just stored in the hair shaft um, at various places so hair does not readily decompose in fact hair will remain on your head until you cut it right it's not going to like decompose off of your head people have some people have incredibly long hair some people have short hair but the hair is really going to stay relatively intact um, for the entirety of an organism's life and can actually hold on to the, the chemical data and the toxin data that that person is subjected to um, for quite a while. So um, by testing different portions of a hair shaft, it may make it possible to construct a timeline of a suspect or victim's exposure to toxins or drugs. Now, these toxins or drugs could be... Um, taken on purpose, they could be taken accidentally, they could be um, given unknowingly to a person, right, in the, in the event of a poisoning. But we know that human hair grows at a rate of approximately 1.3 centimeters per month. Now you obviously could work that out to a particular uh, millimeter number per day, right, if you took that 1.3 centimeter per month value and you divided it by 30 days in the month would actually give you you know roughly the centimeter the millimeter um, growth rate daily 
but we know that it's about 1.3 centimeters per month. And so if you look at a particular human hair, this one happens to be long, and you notice that arsenic, which is a, a toxin or a poison that can actually be fatal, was found 11 centimeters from the root of that particular hair, you can actually use basic math to determine a timeline. And so 11 centimeters divided by the 1.3 centimeter per month growth rate equals roughly 8.46 months ago that that person was subjected to a um, obviously non-lethal dose of arsenic because the you know the person obviously lived for another 8.46 months may currently still be living um, maybe just deceased but uh, we know that arsenic detected in hair from eight months ago obviously wasn't a fatal dose um, because you know eight months worth of hair has grown since that dose so um, if there's a repeated exposure to arsenic then that you know paints a picture that perhaps somebody is intentionally exposing that individual to arsenic um, relatively frequently or or infrequently depending on um, on how it's spaced but um, it could be accidental exposure as well um, I don't know necessarily how you're accidentally exposed to arsenic unless you work in a lab and you're not very careful but um, I'm sure it has happened chemical testing for substances in the hair shaft can also be um, used to um, to look for a variety of other toxins as well. It's not just arsenic, but the way that this works is that you dissolve the hair shaft in an organic solvent that breaks down the hair protein. Again, that hair protein is keratin. And so we subject the hair shaft to an organic solvent that breaks down the hair proteins and then or therefore releases any substances incorporated into the hair like arsenic or like mercury or like any other heavy metal or toxin um, and once those substances are released into the solvent and are therefore released from the hair, they can do or perform different tests that are specific to testing for the presence of a specific compound. Like we have specific tests that test for the, the presence of arsenic. We have specific tests that test for the presence of mercury. We have specific tests that test for the presence of um, illicit drugs, right? So, once you release the chemicals that are incorporated into the hair shaft into the organic solvent, we can then start to perform our, diagnostic, our, our diagnostic testing on the particular uh, toxins or the particular drugs within that solvent that now possesses them that are um, obviously not locked in the hair. So, scientists have also devised a tracking system for suspects or victims that uses isotope analysis of a strand of hair. Um, and this is actually a pretty cool concept in, in that it involves determining the ratio of different forms of certain elements in a person's hair and body tissues, which provides information about where a person lived over several months, which is useful to crime scene investigators because of the fact um, that it, it obviously paints a, a um, either pro alibi or it, it refutes an alibi like if a person says they didn't live in a particular location during the commission of a crime but the isotope um, data from their hair says otherwise and in fact proves that they were in that location for that particular span of time then it obviously looks bad for the individual uh, given that they are essentially lying uh, and it is possible to determine where in the United States a person was living by examining the oxygen and hydrogen isotopes in hair and body tissues because of the fact that different locations around the United States have different oxygen and hydrogen concentrations slightly uh, but they are different concentrations and so by analyzing a single hair it provides a complete timeline of a person's movements over the past few months um, if they move from Atlanta let's say to Topeka Kansas over the course of a few months worth of hair growth you can actually look at the different sections of hair and um, and use these isotope data of oxygen and hydrogen isotopes in order to determine when they actually left Atlanta and when they actually arrived in Topeka and it's not you know open to debate it's not based on alibi eyewitness accounts it's literally science um, proving where in the United States they are at a given time so hair examination and testing hair is examined microscopically for physical properties 
We've talked about that in uh, past videos. We know that the physical um, examination can lead to cuticle um, differences, can lead to medulla differences, can lead to different cortical um, cortical differences, especially if you're looking at animal versus human hairs. If a hair is consistent physically, because the physical examination is always step one, okay, we don't want to jump to all the chemical and forensic testing with chemicals um, without actually physically examining it first, because a lot of those chemical tests can actually tear down the protein um, and make the hair useless when we want to then physically examine it. So the very first step is you want to physically or microscopically examine hair for physical properties. And if the hair is physically consistent with a suspect or victim, investigators will move on to a more thorough techniques, which could be examining the hair chemically for toxins and drugs. It could be examining the hair for the presence of mitochondrial DNA. It could be testing for the presence of um, nuclear DNA. But either way, if we are testing for mitochondrial or nuclear DNA, we have to clean the hair first. We have to ground up the hair and add to a sterile solution because we don't want to inject our hair DNA or any potential DNA um, contained within the hair into a non-sterile uh, solution because the non-sterile solution might contain DNA from the investigator, let's say. We then need to chemically digest the hair by enzymes. We then need to DNA or we need to extract the DNA and amplify, meaning we need to make a bunch of copies of it, and that's called polymerase chain reaction. Later on in the semester, we're going to actually do PCR type um, virtual labs in which we will um, kind of study and look at how DNA is actually copied and amplified numerous times over the course of a polymerase chain reaction. But once we have tons of copies, then we can actually produce a DNA profile using an automated process and an automated data bank, um, which, like it says, is in future chapters, and so we will get into that um, later. But for now, just know that hair is, is going to be examined for physical properties microscopically before an investigator moves into chemical analysis of a particular hair and looking for um, toxins, drugs, and the presence of DNA. Okay, I hope this video was helpful. See ya.